Hey everyone, welcome to Ask Me Anything, Web Vitals Edition. I'm your host, Philip Walton, and I'm here with Elizabeth Sweeney, John Mueller, and Annie Sullivan to help me answer some of your questions. As a reminder, if you're watching this live and you're a registered attendee, don't forget that you can ask questions live by tapping on the Q&A icon to the right of the live stream video on the IO website. Okay, let's get started. So it looks like the first question we have here is, how does Google determine a page's Core Web Vitals scores? Uh, this is a very important question. Um, Annie, do you want to maybe want to take this one? Yeah, so uh, we measure the the three Core Web Vitals in Chrome: the first input delay, the cumulative layout shift, and the largest contentful paint for every page load. And then we take the seventy fifth percentile of each of those uh, separately. So. If, uh, if your 75th percentile of all your page loads uh, meets uh, largest contentful paints 2,500 uh, 2, millisecond threshold, then uh, your peach page meets largest contentful paint. If it meets the 10, uh, 0.1 CLS threshold separately at the 75th percentile, it also meets. And then either it meets the fit threshold or uh, since not every page has input, uh, it doesn't have enough samples, then it, it meets the first input delay. Uh, but these are our real user data from Chromium. Does anyone want to add anything? Just, I guess, that last point that you just said, the last line is, I think, really important. This is real user data coming from Chrome users uh, who have opted into sharing user statistics. It's not uh, Googlebot or anything like that, right? Yeah, I think exactly. they actually... Go the ahead, fact that it's like 75th across the board, too. So it's just, you know, three out of four are going to be having a good experience. You're trying to meet that bar. I kind of like thinking about it that way too. I find that helpful. Yeah, I think this is a great transition to the next question, um, which is why am I seeing different scores reported in different tools such as Lighthouse and the Chrome user experience report? Yeah, and so- I, You go ahead. Yeah, I can I can take that one, and and uh, I'd obviously love to hear other folks' thoughts too, but um, I could have an entire AMA just on this, <laughs> um, and and that is because there's a lot to kind of tease apart here. Um, I'll take a stab at a few of the key points. Um, one of the first ones is that we have two fundamentally different sources of data here that we're dealing with. So we have our field data, which is just as Annie and Phil just mentioned, that is used for Core Web Vitals, this is, okay, what are your real users experiencing? This is people who are engaging with your content and you are getting signals back from them as to how good their experience is. But you need a way to debug and diagnose that before your user is engaging with that content. And so you wanna have some more control and, and some more granular uh, you know, data there. And that's where simulated data comes in, also called lab data. So that's the first key point is that there are two different data sources. And so you are going to see different, uh, you're gonna see different values because one is representing all of your users and then the other is representing a simulated load. Um, the second point I'll make, and then I'd love to hear if I've missed anything from folks, um, is that there are also different runtime conditions depending on the tool that you're looking at. So for instance, if you're accessing Lighthouse in the DevTools panel, then you are going to be operating locally on your own machine. It's going to represent conditions that are local to you. Whereas if you're using PSI, you are pinging servers and getting that response back. So there are gonna be deltas uh, there as well. Yeah, and I think you know to, to summarize some of that or restate some of the important points, Lighthouse is a lab-based tool, meaning a real user is not interacting with it. Um, it's running a simulated environment, whereas the Chrome user experience report, which is where the core vitals data that you'll see in tools like Search Console or PageSpeed Insights is coming from what we call field data. Sometimes it's called ROM data. This is coming from real users that are actually going to those pages and interacting with them. Um, and so the difference is often, you know, there are different tools in the lab setting, as Elizabeth said, but um, the difference between field data and lab data is really important, important to understand. And if you go to what about dev slash vitals? There's lots of content there. Um, and so I think people can go there if they have more questions. Uh, so it looks like the next question is, what are web vitals? I think maybe another way to phrase this question is, what is the difference between web vitals and core web vitals? I think I'll, I'll take a stab at answering this. So web vitals is the name of the 
initiative or, or the program that we have here uh, in Chrome um, that you know covers it covers encompasses everything <laughs> the, the whole Web Vitals program. Web Vitals is also a term that we use to describe the individual metrics that are part of the Web Vitals program. The core web vitals specifically are the um, the web vitals, the subset of web vitals that we feel like are the most important to measure. And they have to meet certain criteria to be core web vitals. So they have to be measurable in the field by real users. Um, and they, they have to be representative of the user experience. Um, and they have to generally apply to all web pages. And so if you are looking for just like the minimal amount of things to focus on, the core web vitals is a great place to start. And then we have other web vitals that are often um, that are good performance uh, metrics to care about, and they are useful in debugging, and they're helpful to debug the core web vitals. So, for example, time to first byte is a web vital, um, and time to first byte is often useful in debugging your largest contentful paint. It helps you know whether maybe your server is slow or your um, kind of browser code, uh, like front end code, is, is slow. And so, this is kind of how I think about the differences. Does anybody else have any? Anything they want to add? I'm, I'm not seeing anyone jump in. No. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, is inclusion in Crux based purely on having enough data collected for a URL for a statistically relevant sample size, or is there other capping to X amount of URLs or origins? If sample size is the primary concern, is there a good rule of thumb to be aware of when collecting your own run data? Um, so I'm not 100% sure exactly what this question is asking. Um, to the last part of the question, is there a good rule of thumb? I, I would say if you can, don't you don't necessarily want to sample your run data. You want to get as much of it as you can to get the most representative um, you know, sample size, which is the full sample size. If you have to sample for some reason, you know, you can you can certainly do that, but we would recommend not sampling. Um, for the question about the crux thresholds or crux based, I don't know, Elizabeth, do you want to maybe comment on that? Yeah, I mean, at a high level, um, you know, we we just want to make sure that whatever we're actually sharing has reached a certain threshold for anonymization properly. So, you know, that's kind of how we we determine, you know, what what you know where that threshold is in terms of what we're actually kind of publishing in the crux data set um but that's that's very high level <laughs> i don't have much beyond that we don't do any capping though like if you have more data than the the minimum sample size there's just more data being used to calculate the crux scores um okay let's go to the next one um this question says uh, AMP prides itself on resolving all three of the core web vitals, uh, but it does, dot, 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 when click from SERP and pass through the AMP cache. When the source is tested with PSI, it gets a score that leaves much to be desired. Does the tracking signal take this disparity into account? Um, I think the short answer is yes, it does. I don't know if anybody wants to expand on that. Yeah, we... we are really serious about, again, always using real user data and what real users are experiencing. So something goes through the AMP cache, we're measuring that. If it's going through AMP origin, we're just, we're measuring what the user sees, no matter like which way the page may or may not be using AMP. Right, so if, if more people are, are visiting a page from the search engine results page, then maybe, and those pages load fast because they're coming from the cache, then the scores could be better. If more people happen to be going directly to the origin, the pages might be lower, but it, it just depends on what the real user is seeing. And I, I guess it also depends on what, what they do after they land on that initial page, right? Yeah, absolutely. If they're if they're navigating to other pages on the site, um, they you know those aren't necessarily coming from the AMP cache. Okay. So uh, the next question um, reads: Crux is useful for public for a publicly accessible site, do you have any idea on how we can get that similar data for a private accessible site? Private here means, let's say the web app is only accessible through a web container in a native app. Um, 
crux is this is true that crux is accessible only to a publicly accessible site um but you can use your own uh run real user monitoring data for any site and this is what we recommend that everyone does whether you have a public site or a private site um I don't know if we have much more to say about this. Uh, we, we, we always recommend using RUM data. Uh, RUM data is much easier to analyze and debug. Crux data is great to kind of understand how does Google see the performance and maybe compare it to your RUM data. But um, using Google data for debugging purposes and other things is, is not what we recommend just because it's, it's usually too high level. Anyone else want to add anything to that? I should add that Philip wrote an awesome webvitals.js library and also gave a, I think a talk yesterday about how to send that data to Google Analytics. Um, so there are like uh, a lot, there's a lot of documentation out there about how to collect your own RUM data. Thanks for the shout out, Annie. Okay, the next question is, will desktop core vitals data be part of the initial page experience update or added in later? So, uh, John, do you want to answer this? Um, I, I think we touched upon this y yesterday in one of the sessions as well, where we, we also mentioned that we're going to start taking a look at the desktop data as well, but that will happen at some later point. So not, not with this initial launch that is happening this summer. Yeah, but you shouldn't ignore desktop just because it's not part of the initial rollout. That would be my personal opinion. OK, so the next question is, um, the field data in Lighthouse slash PageSpeed Insights being a 28-day aggregation makes it impossible to take action on the data and be able to be sure the action truly was resolved. Are there any plans to either shorten the window or perhaps plot the data on a graph so we can see changes over time? So this gets back to the original, or the earlier point that I made is that you should really be using uh, your own RUM analytics solution to monitor Core Web Vitals. Um, you should not necessarily be depending upon these tools to debug your performance. So for example, let's say you see you have a problem in PageSpeed Insights, the scores are worse than you think they should be. You know, you wanna be going into your code, making the changes, you wanna be then deploying those changes to production. Um, and at that point, you definitely do not want to be going into PageSpeed Insights to check to see if, you know, your your performance improved. Because as the question states, you'll have to wait kind of 28 days before the data fully catches up. That's the time to be going into your RUM analytics provider to get your you know, real-time data or, you know, the, the current day's data or the previous day's data to understand if, if the data improved. Also, a uh, hot tip, I definitely recommend if you're using a RUM analytics provider to send as like a custom dimension or custom parameter or whatever your, your analytic solution calls your page's version. So when you deploy a new version, you can easily compare, did this version have a performance improvement? If, the, if it's all kind of mixed together in, in a single analytics bucket, um, the data can be a little bit, a little bit noisy there. And yeah. you can see a graph of the data over time in Search Console. So it's like it's still the 28 days delay there, but uh, you also see what it was like before. Yeah, and I'd also love to add that this is this is one of the things that uh, where synthetic data can also just help. Uh, I'm definitely you have to validate with your field data, and you do have to wait for it. You know, so so not not detracting from that point at all. That's that's critical to note that the true validation happens there. Um, but when you're iterating and you're needing to make sure, okay, hey, did the change I just make, is this going to cause a regression? Um, this is where just running your lab test, making sure you didn't break anything, making sure it didn't affect the metrics too too much um, can be really, really impactful. Um, and, and yeah, seeing these things over time is something that um, I know a lot of the tooling teams are kind of looking at as far as, okay, we kind of give you a lot of um, a lot of information when when you're still you know we give you a speedometer when you're in the driveway, um, so when you're you know in when you're iterating and all of this we're like okay here's how you're doing and then as soon as you're in production and you're on the road we take the speedometer away and we're like good luck <laughs> so figuring out how we can make sure that you have really robust monitoring solutions as john mentioned search console is a great place to go for that time tracking um, but we are thinking about other ways to to help you out there 
right? Um, lab data is great when you are making your changes locally and you're monitoring, like, or you send it uh, to a staging environment before you deploy to make sure that the performance is, you know, as you expect. But you hope that this is kind of predictive of the performance that you want to see. Um, so that's kind of step one. And then step two is after you deploy to production, you look at your field data, your RUM data, to confirm that it actually is that your users are experiencing the way that your lab tools predict that they would. Uh, okay, so the next question is, uh, when did the five second cap for CLS go into production? Should site owners expect a shift in CLS data around that date? Um, so I believe that the answer is that uh, it's not in production yet, but it will be prior to um, the page experience launch later this summer and fall. Uh, correct me, is that correct, John? I don't know. <laughs> I think I think there will. My understanding is that the data currently being shown in Search Console is the is the older definition of CLS, and at some point in the next couple of weeks or maybe month, it will switch over to the new version, and there will be an annotation in Search Console. I believe. I um, hope I'm not giving false information. Yeah, I, I think I think that was a plan. Yeah. But it will certainly be um, for anyone wondering the. Uh, any ranking effect that happens will be based on the new definition, um, not the older definition. And um, in the next couple of weeks, we're looking to roll out all of the tools with the newer definition as well. Lighthouse, um, Crux, PageSpeed Insights. Um, if you're using the Web Vitals JavaScript library, there is a beta version already released with the new definition added to that um, uh, beta one, I believe. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, is the page experience ranking boost per country? For example, LCP at um, the 75th percentile is two seconds from visitors within the UK, but four seconds from Australia, making my global P75 uh, 2.6, so average. Uh, will searches from the UK get the ranking boost because of good LCP? Um, so I, I think this is an interesting example. This might be a real world example, but I would also say that you know if you're using a content delivery network, you can often mitigate some of these performance concerns. Like um, it, it shouldn't necessarily be the case that certain countries have way worse performance um, from from that perspective. If people's internet connections are tend to be slower in a certain country, then then that can affect things certainly. But um, when I look at the data, and if you go to um, Web Almanac, uh, which is a great resource, uh, internet connection speeds across the globe are getting faster and faster. And I think that the, to some degree, it's a misconception that there are like kind of fast countries and, and slow countries, at least based on super recent data. Um, but I think, Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, my, my understanding is that no, like it's, it's all of the, all Chrome users together creates the score. Correct. Yeah, it's all Chrome users together. This is a, a part of the reason why we're using the 75th percentile. So in that example, like more than a quarter of your customers are in Australia and they're getting slower times. And so that that we think that, you know, that that should be reflected in the score, that ideally you'd be using a CDN. Uh, and and uh, again, what the folks said is that uh, that is what we see when we look at like uh, navigations in various countries that, that we're not seeing slower navigations overall in, in certain countries. Yeah, I think a general meta point is, uh, I think a lot of times people like imagine these hypotheticals and get concerned that uh, some situation is gonna affect my core vital scores in some weird way. I would always encourage you to just measure it and look and see what the data is actually saying. Um, a lot of times we see that these concerns don't actually manifest, manifest themselves in reality. Um, Okay, the next question. Uh, in the context of the page experience update, does Core Vitals use only data for the specific page or combination of page and origin level data? Oh, how much how much time do you have? Here? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a great question, and this is, I think, uh, a source of confusion because um, a lot of tools will report origin level data 
Uh, and so I think that can sometimes make it more confusing than it needs to be where people might think that you get like a single score for your entire site. But um, yeah, but that's not true. You get a score per page in some cases. In some cases, you get a score per page group. If you go into Search Console, you might see page groups that all have kind of a certain score. Um, depending on how much data the site has, you might then not have enough, you know, it might be all pages in the same origin will be grouped together. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking. Anybody else want to jump in? It's, it's definitely, so exactly as you said, you know, there's kind of this, this tiered approach as far as availability of data. Um, I, I do wonder, and I'm asking a question of the group, but um, is there, I know that there, this is documented in various places, like pieces of it. I do wonder if we have a single resource that just, just dives into this specifically. And I think maybe Phil or John might know the answer to that. I, I don't think we have anything specific to search that goes into all of the details on how we use it for ranking. Uh, we, we do have an extremely comprehensive FAQ though. So that's in, in the help forum. Um, I, I definitely check that out. I don't know if this particular question would be there, probably. Uh, and if it's not there, we can, we can expand that there as well. But uh, that's, that's kind of, I, I think, the best place to go for a general overview of how we would use uh, page experience within search as a ranking factor. Um, but it's not, like, for, for most of the ranking signals that we have, we don't have like one documentation page that says, this is how exactly we use this signal in ranking, because there's just so many edge cases and also situations where we need to have the flexibility to adapt to like changes that, that happen in the ecosystem as well. Yeah, I, I think to get at the spirit of the question, um, I, I would encourage people to think about it based on, on the page. So if you have an important page to your site that a lot of people are coming to from search, I would look at the core vital scores for that page um, and even though it might not always be the case in all these you know, certain complex situations or combinations of factors, but in terms of if you just want to simplify it for yourself, I would look at the scores for that page. So if the user goes to that page and the experience is fast, and then they go to another page and the experience is slow, that slow page's score is not necessarily going to affect the ranking of the fast page um, that's important to you. Okay, uh, so the next question. Uh, what is the most common detriment to sites core vitals that also has the most significant effect if fixed? Basically, how should someone prioritize what to fix? Uh, this is an interesting question. So I will take a different strategy. I would look at your own site's data. I would look at the crux data first. What are the real users seeing? And then from there, which of those metrics uh, are, are not uh, meeting core web vitals. So maybe your LCP is poor, but your CLS is good. Uh, in that case, you want to look at LCP. Well, then the question is, well, what do you do? Uh, at that point, lab tooling like Lighthouse can be really, really impactful and effective to show you like how to, how to uh, narrow down that specific score. But I would start with your RUM data. W what I'm seeing looking at lots and lots of sites every day is that every site is different but that most of the things a site could change if they took that approach of which metrics are poor, uh, and what does Lighthouse have to say about those, that, that all of those sites could improve pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I really like that, that, that approach, Annie, too, because you're, you're also then looking at, okay, because you're looking at the field data first, you're going, okay, are my users struggling with interactivity or content loading or is, is, are, is stuff moving around on them? So you're not only, just remember that, that these metrics are directly linking to some sort of pain point or delightful thing that's happening to your users. Um, so you can be thinking, the, the reason I bring it up in that way is that if you see, for instance, that your FID is suffering, you can then think about, okay, how do I, what is gonna impact interactivity? And that lens on it starts to help you to kind of just research and, and dive deep. But yeah, the as Annie said, the the next step too is you know Lighthouse. And as of as of this week, we have a new metrics filter too, so you can filter the opportunities um, by metric. 
So if you want to focus on CLS because you see that's what your users are having a hard time with, you can now kind of prioritize what's going to have the most impact there. Yeah, and since I, I feel like we didn't give the most satisfying answer to this person, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> so we kind of give some some non answers <laughs> to try to give an answer. Which which again, Annie's point is is the the one you should take away that it, you should look at your own data. But if we we're going to give a general one size fits all answer to this question, I would say that we see in the data that LCP is the metric that most sites um, struggle with. Uh, like the fewest number of sites meet the LCP good threshold. And probably the biggest reason that it is is because their images are not optimized. Um, and so I would say if there's one thing you maybe want to start with, look to optimize your images. That's probably the, you know, the one thing I would say. Okay, uh, so next question. Is page experience a binary ranking factor? Uh, only good experience pages can get the ranking boost, or is there a gradation in how page experience signals affect ranking? One kind of slow page might get a boost over an even slower page. Uh, yes, this is a great question. Um, it is not a binary. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know, kind of. It is mostly not a binary signal. Um, basically, we know. Actually, probably, John, you're, you're probably the best person to answer this, uh, being on search yourself. Yeah. Um, we, so, so I, I think first of all, we, we continue to take relevance into account when it comes to search. So it's not just like if you're a tiny bit faster, then you will rank above everyone else. Uh, but relevance does play a really strong role there as well. Uh, but within this signal, we, we kind of go in, in the area from needs improvement to good. That's kind of the range where we would see a gradual improvement with regards to the ranking signal. And once you've, reach kind of that good threshold, then that's for us is, is kind of like a pretty high bar. And you're kind of at that stable point. And at that point, like micro optimizing things like extra milliseconds here and there, that's not going to do your site in ranking anything specific. Uh, it might have an effect on what users see. And with that, you might have other positive effects. Uh, but at least when it comes to search ranking, that's not going to be something where you're going to see improvements if you're like 5 milliseconds faster than the next one. Yeah. And, and definitely a point that I want to clarify, because I've heard some people, there's been some, you know, some confusion about this. It is not the case that unless you reach the good threshold for all of the core web metrics, like you have to reach that threshold to get a ranking boost. That is not the case. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. Um, once you reach the, I mean, you will get a ranking boost for reaching the good threshold for all pages. But beyond that point, you don't get additional boost for reaching it even better. Like if you have your LCP at two seconds and you get it all the way down to one second, um, you know, we've kind of publicly stated that that will not increase your ranking. However, if you have a very, very slow page, like maybe LCP is 20 seconds, and you improve it to 10 seconds, that could potentially um, uh, boost your ranking. Yeah, we get a lot of questions about specifically the good and like, wow, that's really hard to meet. And yes, it is. It's supposed to identify the best content on the web and that you don't really necessarily, we, we can't say that you need to improve beyond that. You might see additional benefits from your users, but we, we don't uh, take that into account. Yeah. Um, so I think actually we are out of time. Uh, so uh, just thanks everyone for, for joining um, and watching on the live stream for submitting questions. These were great questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us over other channels, Twitter or um, you know whatever choice we want to reach out to us. At. Um, if you have more questions about uh, Core Vitals specifically, again, please go over to web.dev slash vitals. Um, many of your questions can probably be answered there. Um, yeah, so thanks to all my uh, co-AMA hosts for, for joining us, and thanks for everyone for watching again, and we'll see you all again soon. All right, bye.